Welcome to Talk Design, the show where creatives have conversations. I'm Adrian Ramsey and I'm your host. Having lived a life of design myself, I wanted to share with you the creatives that inspire me and in turn may inspire you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Adrian Ramsey and I'm your host on Talk Design. I started this podcast because I wanted to share the journey of design that I've had and that many others have had. And I find it inspirational talking to people globally about what makes design tick and what makes design create a better world for others. My journey has taken me from clothing globally, women's swimwear, performance sportswear, mountaineering, yachting, all these kind of genres where each place I would learn more and more about different specifics and how clothing can support those. Also, I've worked in innovation as a systematic innovation trainer and worked with the aerospace industry as well as the marketing industry and the design industry. And all my years of design, still my favorite is the built structure and interiors. And years of travel, and discovery, I constantly look at what the emotions are that are created by the built space. I consider myself a student of design for my whole life and will go on that way. Some of the things that I do to support this is my podcast and then workshops and masterclasses where I teach people about trends and design thinking and tours where I take people on tour with me and we go and discover different points of architecture or interior design globally. I always think that when you're passionate about something, one of the things that you should do is is you should share it. And so creating the podcast was my way of sharing my enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of others and their passions around design with you. I hope you really enjoy it. And I ask you, would you please drop us a line? Tell us what you think. Tell us what got you excited. It's so inspiring when we get messages from our listeners that tell us about the things that shifted in their life because of who they listen to. And it gives me the inspiration to dig deeper and find more people that I can bring to your ears so that you live a better design life. My guest on Talk Design today is Lani Armstrong. Now, Lani is a builder in Austin, Texas, and he's got a wealth of experience as a builder, and we're going to dig into some of that. And then also, he started his own podcast, which is called In the House Podcast. And this is a fascinating look inside the building world with his guests. And uh, I remember when I think you were maybe one or two episodes in, and spawn your podcast and going, oh, okay, I'm going to have a listen to this. And it's interesting to watch how it's evolved over probably six or eight months already, maybe longer. And it's great fun. It's, uh, I find that podcast where there's a lot that you can learn from when you're listening is really valuable. And certainly in this industry, you know, in the design and construct industry, there is so much to learn because it's such a complex industry. So Lani, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for having me on. Hey, man, you're the number one for my New Year's. This is uh, this is the first recording for the New Year's. I'm probably a little scratchy. I've had three weeks off. Uh, well, I'm honored. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here, man. So I want to kick off with just a little bit about why are you a builder? Um, how did that happen? Out of all the things you cho- could have done in life, somewhere along the line you chose to be a builder. What was that about? You know, I've uh, I've always been interested in in how things work, and uh, you, you know, even as a little kid, you know, I was always getting in things, taking things apart. And one one story I've, I've shared several times is you know taking apart the family piano, and my my parents had a big stand up piano in the li- in the living room, and you know they come home one day and it's torn and into bits. pieces and in in bits and pieces, and I just wanted to get in there and see how it worked and you know put it all back together and 
so I was always tinkering with things. I was, uh, yeah. I was always in the garage doing stuff. You know, I got into art and, and sculpture later uh-huh. on in, in high school. Yep. Um, so just I think being creative, being working with my hands and, and just getting dirty. And so I actually didn't, I, I didn't know I wanted to go into construction, I, I guess. So my pathway is, is kind of meanders, you know, a bit, you know, through high school. Like I said, I was, I was into art and, you know, painting and sculpture and uh, really into design. Um, I actually, you remember that old show? I don't know if you, the Orange County Choppers. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. With the, with the motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. So I, I loved that show and West Coast Choppers. West uh, Coast Choppers. Yeah, I'm trying to think what, of the guy's this? name. Yeah, yeah, I know the um, show. I know the show. Yeah, the yeah, it's on the on the yeah. tip of my tongue. I can't think of it. Which I, I think he's actually here in Austin now. Uh, interesting enough, but um, I was always interested in those shows, and I was really, I really loved motorcycles, and I still do. And so, you know, at the time, I wanted to open my own shop and build motorcycles, and I had a uh, a notebook full of designs. You know, I would draw motorcycles, and and I was just really into that, and. So wow. I, I had always been interested in, in design. And so I graduate high school and I, I actually go to a mil- military school in Missouri for a year. And then I transfer into the, the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And yeah, wow. so I was there for, I was there for, I think, uh, freshman and sophomore year. So I was there for a little while. Um, and I wanted to when I was there, going to mechanical engineering, you know, because, yep. like I said, I was just the always interested with chopper thing, how, motorcycles, it, hack and yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know the correlation between the two, but again, it's just in my mind, mechanical engineering, you know, machinery, and robotics, and and all of that was was super interesting to me. But I just I didn't have the grades to to really declare that major. You you had to have yep. a certain GPA to be able to declare that as your major. And so I, I left there. I'm not really sure, you know, what I was going to do. I, I worked for a little while back home and, you know, I got to reading about the School of Architecture at, uh-huh. at Texas A&M, uh-huh. you know, because I, I, I figured I would kind of go back into yeah. design. And yeah. uh, uh, but at, at the time, my view of what an architect was, was, you know, somebody just sitting in an office cubicle all day, just drawing, you know, drawing pictures of houses or, you know, details or something. And that, that didn't really appeal isn't to that, me. You know, I think I, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. That's most of it anyway. But so that didn't, that didn't, that side of it didn't appeal to me. I, I wanted to be out in the field and. Yeah. So that's that's where I stumbled upon uh, construction science, which is under the School of Architecture, and I got to reading about that degree program and it seemed interesting. I'd give it a shot, and you know, one thing led to another, and you know, graduated A and M with a bachelor's in construction science, and wow. moved to Austin, Texas. It's it's kind of a wild story how I got to how I got to Austin. Kind of a miracle, actually, how I ended up here. So you didn't start in Austin, though. Where were you born? Where Where was you? Where <clears> did you go to school as a kid? Like, yeah, I was I was born in Houston. Okay. And so I went I went to school in Houston for a while, and then we actually moved out to Branham, Texas. Uh-huh. I don't know if you know where that is. Not really. Home Home of Bluebell Ice Cream. If you ever Oh sure. Ever yeah. Had, yeah, 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 plenty. That's, yeah. So. That's that's Brenham says, and so that's that's where I went to school. That's where I finished up. I think from fourth grade on all the way to high school. So grew up in kind of a small country town, and I watched it watched it expand over the years. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm from. But, you're I, I met a, my but you are a native. Te- you're a native Texan. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Austin is Austin doesn't have as many native Texans as maybe a lot of the rest of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much more used to. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of a lot of Californians moving here. Yeah, it's pretty diluted. But, uh... in, in a, you know, I've, I've been going to Austin, goodness, I don't know, eight or nine years, something like that, at, regularly. And mm-hmm. just the change that I see, and, you know, you'll be sitting somewhere, and the people that are around you won't be 
Texans necessarily. They'll be from all over the world, like especially because it's such a tech. Yeah. Oh, that, for sure. That you know, like you'll be sitting in a bar or sitting in a eatery or something, and you look around, and yeah, the number of, especially in Austin, the number of actual Texans would be probably thirty percent or maybe fifty percent. I think often, especially in yeah. Austin. Yeah. It's a very internationalized yeah, town. It is, yeah. It's a major hub. Like I said, it's a big tech town. Mm. You know, now, you know, and then of course Musk brought a Tesla headquarters to to Austin, just outside of Austin. So, yeah, yeah that, I mean, that brought a lot of jobs too. So it's it's growing. It's 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 a booming little town, that's for sure. Not so, so little anymore. But so how did what was the miracle other than getting your p- parents' piano back together? What was the miracle? <laughs> <laughs> that's got to be miracle number one. Oh my God, yeah. I, 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 you're saying it and I'm going, he what? You pulled the piano apart? <laughs> um, yeah. So I, uh, there's a lovely piece in there of self-confidence, you know, self-belief and self-confidence. When you start pulling yeah. the piano apart, I can put this back together. <laughs> How hard could it be? Oh, Somebody... you got to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah. the miracle of ending up in Austin, what, what happened there? What was the kind of line that took you from... Missouri was yeah, it? Yeah, I, uh, well, yeah, so like I said, I, I, you know, I'm coming back from the Air Force Academy. And did and A&M. A- yeah, I went, yeah. went through A&M. So your last, you're basically your senior year at A&M, you have to do a, uh, an internship. Uh, that's part of the program. So did my internship and I fully believed I was going to have a job with the company that I interned for. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but it was, it's another, like a big production builder. A, pr- a pretty high-end production builder. Um, and so I actually got extended a job offer to that company. And, you know, luckily I, you know, I listened to my wife's advice. <laughs> I was married at the, you know, before I graduated A&M, but she told me, you know, you might have a job offer with this company, but it's probably a good idea to go ahead and just put some feelers out, send your resume to other companies and, you know, just, just in case. See what the world is yeah okay sure you know i'll i'll do it so called called some other builders and just said hey you know this is who i am you know here's my resume if you're looking to hire nope nobody was looking to hire so so several months later graduated i mean we get an apartment here in austin we're moving our stuff in and the builder who i had an offer with they called me and said you know you, you no longer have a job here you no longer have a uh, offer they rescinded their offer and so i'm like man what what am i gonna do you know we're here we are moving in we've already paid a deposit and we're moving our furniture in and now i don't have a job and you know lo and behold with, within an hour of getting that email i got a call from another builder in austin one of the builders that i had sent my resume to a few months before. yeah like yep. it's quite it's I mean, there'll be so many people who can parallel a story like that where, you know, one door closes, another door opens, and it actually takes you maybe on a better journey than you would have had otherwise. And Oh, 100%. Yes, you know, absolutely. Just, and also the fact that, you know, like, I don't know whether you believe in manifestation and stuff like that, but when you start committing to a path to go somewhere and you put, you're all in, you're all in, your mm-hmm. furniture's moving. Yeah. And you know, I, I say the universe. I've got this great friend who calls it the Godiverse. But it also conspires to your success. It says you're all in, you're going, you're moving, you're doing. And so mm-hmm. keep keep you know, everything starts to fall into place to keep it moving for you. As long as you have belief. Yeah. So I think it's yeah, a great absolutely. it's a great story of, of how one door closes, another door opens and it ends up with this bigger future that comes from doing it. I love this story oh, also yeah. that you were saying around, you know, the architecture and, and going, oh, will I go and study architecture and then finding construction science and going, you know, like this is actually more like pulling the piano apart and putting the piano back together. But actually yeah. not without necessarily knowing yourself, but knowing yourself well enough to go, I know that I want to be doing this thing physically as opposed mm-hmm. to virtually you know like in in architecture school now there's some schools that they're 
they're creating architects to just work with you know what will be a 3d world it's it's a gaming mm -hmm. world and it's a big employer for architects so this ability to have the vision put things together and actually make 3d things these things will never be physically built and then you go to our schools like i was talking to a guy trevor from dunwoody college and they're still completely hands-on with their design architecture programs where you you know you're making you're making the structure and in yeah. every way they're doing that and you go if it was me i'd be I want to be the completely hands-on as opposed to just drawing it. And it, it comes back to that thing that before we started and we were talking about, you know, like in your job, you deal with architects, interior designers, you know, landscape designers, landscape architects, all these different people. And you're, you're part of guiding their vision and also shaping their vision, I imagine. Mm -hmm. because of the land and your knowledge that you bring to what they're about to do. And I think that that's a, a partnership that, for all the architects listening, really, you can't get what you dreamed up built unless you have somebody who's prepared to build it and it's going to fit within a cost and all those other things. And somebody who's <laughs> equally as passionate about getting the thing out of the ground and up, you know, or into the ground and down, whichever way it's going to go. But like, uh -huh. Unless somebody is in love with that, then it's just a job and then they just turn up and you kind of, you know, the frustrations and everything else, you just get what you get. Um, I think there's a, yeah. finding that little, that, that piece of your niche is genius. Mm -hmm. Like it, and knowing design yeah. as well, knowing design, understanding design. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it's, I don't even know if you necessarily, there's a lot of design, I guess, that I, I don't understand. And, and it's not necessarily, I think, having an understanding, but it's it's appreciating it, maybe. And, mm. and um, you know, I don't, what, I'm, what am I trying to say? It's, you know, you don't have to have that design knowledge. I, I think you just, yeah. like I said, you, you, you know, you got to understand, you know, the vision. You got to be able to see the vision and, and and it's it's hard to find those people i think that are passionate about the design and and what you're trying to achieve mm -hmm. um and and you know yeah i i certainly know from my own business uh when i'm working with builders and you know you kind of <clears throat> niche out these builders that you do like to work with that have that vision and they're they're you know as crazy committed about trying to make the vision work as you are mm -hmm. as the person who drew the vision and you know they they will help with construction method they'll help with you know like even everything really like if the site's going to do this then you know we might have to do this to do these to stabilize this part of it or to do whatever mm -hmm. and uh, an open conversation of design and what the build how it's going to get done in the end yeah that's that's super important and i mean we talked about that too you know with some of the guests that i've had on the show is yeah. you know, how early do you how early do you involve the builder um because that's that's important is you know and that and that's a question that i've that i've had you know for these these guys coming out of architecture school or design mm -hmm. school um you know how do you how do you design a house or how do you design something if you don't know how to build it you know? Easy, man. You just draw some lines. <laughs> I think he's super easy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's all theoretical. It's all theory yep. uh, until you know the the rubber hits hits the road, and you know yep. you, you actually start digging, and you, you know. So having that, I think that that knowledge brought in early on in in the design process, mm. you know, to to try to guide, you know, because every house is unique, every project's different, and so you can't foresee everything but you can definitely kind of learn from you know history and what's what works and what doesn't and you know kind of guide the design i think that the the really amazing part with that is is when you have someone who is in the construction side of it who is looking for i shouldn't say looking for 
who is accepting of the challenge and is a problem solver and has high analytics and really has that thinking of the best way to get to this a for construction and cost but then um, b for the aesthetic that it's going to do or how it's going to deliver that you know like and when mm. you can when you can have that conversation and it's a I want to say a joint vision because in a way it is a joint vision. It might be driven by what the designer is thinking. However, the outcome still, as you say, has to be able to be built. And then there's still mm -hmm. going to be a, a, a price against building it and a timeline and all these other things. I mean, I know in my experience, I've gone, oh, well, I'd really like to use this product like a, a walling system or something. Mm -hmm. And the builder would say to me, yeah, we can, we can. And look, our, <laughs> our, we can tell you that if you use that walling system, it's X amount per square meter minimum. We know that because we've done a little bit of research on it, but we've never used it before. What we can do though, is if we use this walling system, we would be able to guarantee our pricings at this. And so that means that this part of the house, we know we can lock that in. And mm -hmm. we don't have to employ um, a different set of contractors to work on that other system that we don't know their systems right. and all the rest. And we'll go, okay. So you look at say the house and you might go, oh, look, we're talking about a, I don't know, like I'm talking Australian dollars here, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it it could be that it's a, you know, a, a renovation or something or an addition. And you go, huh? it's like, say, three or $400,000 worth. Versus going, I want that walling system in this $4 million build. And now the builder is <laughs> at some kind of risk as well. Whereas at the smaller <laughs> piece where they can test it, test the... The, the people they work with, make sure that everything's right. They're less likely to come unstuck than if it's in this big thing and it goes a little bit sideways or in a lot sideways. And I really learned to appreciate that from builders is like, at the end of the day, their license stays on that structure for mm -hmm. a long time. And we don't want to put them at risk either. So just because we can draw it doesn't mean it's, or, or specify it, you know, like, what should it be? So a meeting of the minds there, yeah. I think, is really valuable as well. I really, I like, I, I believe that the builder, ideally, if we've got a plot of land, the builder would be ideally chosen at that point. And we start mm, the yeah. journey right back after the first few walks on the land, the builder's walking <clears> the <throat> land as well. And then once we start the conceptual you know somatic design i'm not so worried about the builder in that first part there i go let's get some ideas out first of yeah you know, that are in line with the land what the land teaches More us big picture and, stuff yeah and what the clients yeah you know wh whether we're meeting the client dreams and are we expanding their mind and all the rest in the background once we've started to just tighten that up I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's get the builder back involved. We don't always need the three-way conversation at that point, but yeah. we do need a two-way one. And then as soon as we can, uh, because we have a lot of pre-costing, as soon as we can go, okay, with the builder, where are we looking at here? What, what, what kind of dollar value is these crazy pieces that we're adding to this, you know, because they're not all just square boxes with simple gable roofs. <laughs> what yeah. with these other things we're talking about what kind of money is this looking at because this is our budget this is where we're headed and then st really start to dig at that point and probably with less client interaction but more builder interaction and then yeah. refining that through that process so knowing that we're not going to draw this masterpiece that is going to end up yeah, never yeah. being built because it's uh, going to blow the budget so ridiculously. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's important. And, you know, builders, you know, they're the, they're the tip of the spear. So they've, they've certainly, you know, a lot of builders, they've, 
they've done a lot of things wrong and you know they've learned from those mistakes and hopefully yeah. learned from them i guess and so yeah they know generally they know what works and what doesn't and and it's it's always good to have that you know that input i think so during the design i think yeah. also, like you say they're the tip of the spear and they you know they they if something goes wrong there's a big difference between, you know, sort of a hundred thousand dollars worth of drawings and, you know, five million dollars worth of house. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, absolutely. And, yeah, and as the, a, the builder would be is on the hook for that. Yeah, and not only the builder, the client is as well. Like yeah, ultimately it's... the client's the one who ends up with they're the other one spending the money. And <laughs> you know, if, for all not all architecture, I imagine, but just about all architecture and all design, there has to be a patron. And the patron is the one who's paying the bills and making sure the thing happens. You know, it's it's part of their vision, maybe not in the design sense, but it's their vision of life and what they're looking to have and mm -hmm. do. And then they're giving yeah. that up to somebody else. And so there's a sense, this responsibility of carrying it down the line that I go if you can get the whole team on the same page and right down to engineers and everybody, you know, like everybody still being orchestrated by one kind of conductor, but letting each mm -hmm. person or each group take their lead as required. And you need a sure. creative team, I think, to do that. You need a passionate team to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's super important. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell me about you know, so so you work in the build industry this way, and mm -hmm. I know that you build like high end homes mainly. Yeah. That's that's where you're focused, and obviously you work with lots of architects, um, or you come and you bump into the lots of architects along the way in that. And yeah. most of it's around Austin. Austin, for those who don't know Austin, it can be quite steep in uh, in places, and then it can be flat in others. And when you're talking about the kind of homes that you guys do, often they'll be lakeside or they'll be, you know, hillside somewhere. So you're used to building on sloping sites and managing, you know, narrow little roads and pieces like that to get the job done. Oh man, tell me some stories. That's that's <laughs> oh man, that's that's like the the part of construction that you don't really learn or figure out. You know, you don't learn those things in the classroom. That's you. You learn them through experience and just yeah, the logistical nightmares that sometimes you, you have to go through, the hoops you have to jump through. You know, keeping neighbors happy, which is you know, we had a discussion with a upset neighbor just today, and you know, well, okay, for example, I told you, you know, I'm sitting here in my truck, I'm on my own. I I thought I was going to be on my my laptop but you know digging in the front yard with the excavator and they they clip the internet line and so the internet's down so you know you, you just got to roll with the punches and then also you know they they hit a gas line oh. you know that was that was unmarked and and we have this call before you dig service you uh -huh. know here in here in texas and where they can come out and locate your utilities but well this was a gas line that was unmarked and nobody knew it was there and they, you know, they hit that, hit that line and all of a sudden, you know, big old plume of, plume of gas and had to evacuate. And I mean, this was maybe an hour ago that that, that, that yeah, happened wow. and, you know, fire department comes out, it's, it's a big mess, but, you know, they, they get it shut off and repaired. They're here repairing it. It's, it's those things like the, those unforeseen events, you, you make a plan and you try to stick to that plan as best you can, but you got to be flexible. You got to problem solve. Things don't rarely ever go the way that you intended them to go. That's part of the fun of it. You know, it's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. And, but it's and again, definitely part you don't of the learn. Fun. <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's, I mean, it's a headache. It's stressful, but you know, you, you, you learn to deal with it and, um, you know, it's not it's not an easy industry, and it, it requires a lot, you know, a lot of time and attention. And yeah, it's it's fun though. That that's yeah. the fun part is making the plan, trying to execute that plan, and and having a plan B or plan C, and in case things don't go the way you intended them to go, and um, when a problem comes up, you know, how do we solve this? You know, that's that's yeah. not going to break the bank, and 
that's it's not going to affect the the overall design things mm-hmm. like that and and that and that's it's it's fun it's a big puzzle and that's I, what i think draw, draws me to it and that, that's why you know that's the joy of yet. the job <laughs> yeah the joy of the job you know it's just, <laughs> exactly uh, i remember designing yeah. a house and and when the builder rang me and he said um hey we're doing this excavation and uh, we've hit this rock and i'm like okay cool yeah <laughs> and like and he's like well we can't excavate it it's bigger than that and i said oh, okay so what does this mean and he said well it means that you know this front left corner of your house that you've designed may require some changes and i'm like mm, okay like what like i'm <laughs> going and he's going, I don't know, man. He said, we're trying to assess how big this rock really is right now. But at the moment, it's the size of a small truck. And um, so then I'm like, okay, so uh, have you spoken to the engineer yet? He said, yeah, we're waiting on a call back from the engineer. But he said, I thought I'd loop you in. And so then we, you know, like, again, they're in construction mode. They're trying to put their slab down and put yeah. their footings down and everything else. And they had to get the engineer out there. and finally the engineer said look it's so big like they asked him to fully expose the the top of it and you know around the sides and stuff mm-hmm. so big you compare that corner to it uh but we were in highly yeah, reactive yeah. soil as well so like um you know the engineers like going yeah well he beefed up some other beams and the and the slab and stuff and said at the sure, worst sure. that that will be a cantilevered corner <laughs> but like yeah. and, and but but we'll still attach it to the rock and you go yeah okay and just things like that yep and and again the builder in this he's like i'm like oh shit, you know what do we do now kind of thing was i wasn't mm. panicking but yep. it was just like mm. and he's like oh it's, it won't be a problem there's a way it's just i don't know whether we'll be able to get that piece of the corner of the building to be built the way that you think it's going to be built and i'm like oh, well, let, let's all sit down sit down oh, and work it out yeah that's an interesting problem. What, what's well, so you said you're in like a like a beach, community, uh, right? Yeah. Or you're you're kind of in the coast. So what's what's the soil conditions it's, like where you're at? Topography. So where I actually where the house was, and um, we've got like maybe less than a mile off the coast. As you come back, we we run into the hills. So we run into mm. the first of of not particularly high, but you know few hundred feet at least high more than that maybe um hills a range of hills that looks mm. over the coast and that kind of spreads itself down right to the coast in different parts as it as it lowers down and so obviously on the uh, lowlands we've got reasonable has been uh, flood areas and stuff that's kind of controlled and then where i live we have what we call red soil um and it is like it stains everything. Sometimes you'll drive past an old mm-hmm. an old building, like a, on the farm or something, and uh, you will see it kind of fades from dark red to about oh uh, to pale pink as it goes up the side of the building. Once it's halfway up the side of a single story building, it'll just be pale pink, and that's just water <laughs> splash off the ground. Um, yeah, yeah, that's stained splash, it over up. yeah over years. So the, that soil can be fairly reactive. It's got often got clay with it as well. It's really good for growing things in, but it's often got clay, which is reactive clay. And then we have these massive granite boulders as well, like massive, that are just yeah. big, big floaters that are lying in amongst it all. And in this case, we had really? a floater. Yeah. Uh. And to give you another example of that, um, there's a house not far from where I live and this guy bought up uh, five or six blocks of land and he built this humongous house and he it's a long sad story but anyway with it he built this humongous house and pool area and you know guest house and all these things and he was he decided to dig himself a bomb shelter I don't know why but Anyway, whatever his reasoning is, he decides he's got to be prepared. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A <laughs> little bit, little bit probably overstressed for you know somebody living in Australia. But anyway, he dig, starts digging this bomb shelter, and we lived here. So when I say fairly close, it would be maybe oh, 
I'm trying to convert this in my mind as I go, the, the distance. It'd be 30 houses away from us uh, mm. and just, just above us on the hill. In 18 months, they had a rock breaker dig through, uh, through, uh, solid, through solid granite. Jeez. Now, the, the land around it, on the, not necessarily around the sides, but in front of it and stuff, would still come in as a highly reactive piece of land because there'd be clay and there'll be this red soil and you're on the side of the hill. So it would constitute being in a slip zone as well. Mm. Because everything up on top can slide off all that stuff. And so yeah. we would end up with, you know, always big foundations. And then when we're on the top of the hill, we've got a highly reactive soil and clay. that, And that's where this other house I designed was. That highly reactive soil clay mixture means that as we go through our wet season, it moves around a mm. bit. Then it dries out yep. and shrinks a bit. And then it... You know, so it might swell back up when it gets wet again, but then it dries out and shrinks a bit. So you've got this sure. constant movement. So you'll often see houses either with deep piers and a beam slab construction. So there'll be lots yeah, of yeah. beams. So it's essentially, Pier and beam, yeah. yeah. Or <clears throat> it might be rafted. So it might be on a on yeah. a raft. So it's floating. Those are the two general ones that we would see. But the land often yeah. here in this area, uh, an old established area, also doesn't get bulldozed around a lot. It's not like uh, you might you might cut and fill, but it's not like a subdivision where you just run a bulldozer over the whole thing and you know make fifty house sites or a hundred house sites and curate all the land for yeah. it. You know, if there's no, I got you. Yeah, so that's our general and and. That extends well back off the coast as well as on the coastal strip. On the coastal strip, yeah, we've built on sand plenty of times. So, oh. yeah, again, just yeah, wild. That's wild why stuff. we have engineers. Exactly. Yeah, another important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and, and you know, we have a lot of we have quite a bit of flood zone where we are as well, and then we have fire zones, and then we have koala habitat, and we have diverse zones and we have one place we did just recently they had platypus habitat so all these different things that are part of the protection and the layers of protection that we have to assess when we're putting something together and mm -hmm. fire is a big one you know like our firefighters from australia go to california when you have big fires and your californian firefighters and beyond come out to australia when we have big forest fires we share yeah. resources between countries with the technology and also the human element of it to uh, make that work because we both That's have cool. big fire zones. And Australia and America are the same land mass, but, you know, not including Alaska and the islands, but the, we're the same land mass mm -hmm. almost. So it, a big space, big space. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting. And I find, you know, talking to builders, and people in the construction side of it equally as interesting as talking to somebody who is in the design side of it because when you find that mix that's where the magic i believe yeah. really happens yeah it's, i it's, i agree yeah and you know with our podcast that, that i'm doing it's it's kind of been that way i've tried to get a mix mainly to try to understand you know how an architect thinks more because yeah, man, sometimes talking. Have you found two that think the same? <laughs> Say that again. I said, have you found two that think the same? No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, but I am I try to kind of branch out of my, my comfort zone, I guess, and, and, and have people on that are in different industries, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd like to include you know, more people who are, who are maybe outside of design and construction, you know, and because I, I think the thing that interests me the most is, you know, pe people who are just passionate about what they do, you know, whether it's design or construction, it, it doesn't matter, or you're a chef or, or yeah. an artist or, yeah. Yeah. you know, it doesn't matter that that passion that's there, I think is, is, is very interesting to me and kind of diving into that and figuring out like, you know, why that's there and and 
I'm, how I'm you were brought you. up and I'm yeah, with you. It's, like it's, what it's what super influence fun. is it? Like what yeah, what influence is it and what do I learn from each podcast journey? You know, so mm -hmm. like so tell me how you <laughs> what made you when and how what made you start the podcast? What was the thing? I, I have a funny story with mine, which is I was talking to Matt Reisinger and he's yeah. and I was in Texas and I said to him something about, oh, I'd love to have a chat to you about, you know, building into something. He goes, yeah, well, you've got a podcast or a blog thing, don't you? Let, let's jump on there. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I like this. And I'm like, oh, shit, I don't. Okay, so I better get one. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's a cool story. So it was God, part no, of I yeah, it was part of what I wanted to do, and yeah. I'd gone and interviewed a few different people, like architects and stuff, like, you know, Kevin Alter from Alter Studio. I'd gone and sat with him and interviewed him and recorded it, but I didn't actually yeah. have an outlet for where I was putting recording, and Matt's like, I've right, got, right. got one of them, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I yeah, came, sure. yeah. Yeah, came back to Australia. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Shit, come yeah. with it, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a learning, been a learning experience for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I haven't always been the best communicator. And so part of it, I guess, to challenge myself would, would be to, to start a podcast. And, you know, the nature of what we do, we meet a lot of really cool, interesting people you know from all different backgrounds and and, and they're all really skilled at, at what they do and th that's again just finding that that person that you can tell you know you can always tell the difference between somebody who's passionate about what they do and somebody who just does it to make money you know to, to make ends yeah. meet you know because for those people who are passionate it's it's not about money they could care less about how much they make they just want to be able to to do uh you know their their craft and so you know we, we come across a lot of different people you know in this in this industry and being able to sit down with them and to talk to them and face to face i, I like the the idea of sitting down at the end of the day grabbing a drink and just talking, you yeah. know, cause that's what you do among, among friends and, and family. You, you, you know, you, you come off of a, a hard day, a hard day's work and, you know, you, you go to the, the bar, grab a drink and, and you just talk and, yeah. you know, you might talk about some issues that you're having at work or, you know, talk about some, some, something cool that you saw. And, and, you know, so I like that format. I like, you know, being able to sit down and have a face to face conversation in person. And so these these conversations are, are things that we would have, you know, on a normal normal day. Yeah. And I kind of got the idea to just, you know, why don't we just why don't we start recording it? Put a microphone in the room and, and record some of these conversations that we're having. And and so that's kind of where the idea came about and I didn't quite know. I mean, I had no idea what I was what I was doing. You know, I had no idea about, you know, what's a good microphone to have, what what program I need. Yeah. You know, what what do I do? How do I do this? And so just diving in and figuring it out and um, getting getting it off the ground and just being consistent with it um, is is probably the challenging part. But yeah, I mean, I I'd say that's it. It's in, you know, people. It's, it feels like there's this stigma against like you know people in construction not necessarily the project management side of things but people uh -huh. on the trades uh -huh. where you know if you're if you're in the trade you, you know you're not considered to be talented or highly educated or, uh -huh. or very smart you know because maybe you didn't go to college and it's like you know, that can be the furthest from the truth. I, I've learned so much from oh, yeah. listening to guys that, you know, on the job every day and watching and seeing what they do and, and how interesting, you know, these, these people are and, and getting to know them. I, I, so, I couldn't agree more that if you actually, yeah. you, you know, like the talent that is often unseen that is putting to putting the bricks up or putting whatever that, they're just laying a straight line of bricks for you, but it doesn't mean that's all they know how to do. And yeah, yeah it's like, yeah. Oh. it's fascinating. 
I, I'm I'm blown away. I mean, we are a really I work for a really high end builder here in in Austin, and we have access to some some of the best craftsmen. I mean, in in Texas, um, it, the people that we get to work with, and I'm blown away by how talented these guys are, and men and women both. I mean, from all walks of life, and it, it's incredible to just sometimes I just have to stand there and. I, I might be kind of weird. I might be kind of creeping on them a little bit and making them uncomfortable. But sometimes I like to just stand and watch, like watch people work and see, yeah. see what they do. And, and I'm, I'm blown away by how talented they are. And I so think... I kind of want the, the podcast to go into that direction, you know, where you get some of these people mm -hmm. on, you know, who you don't hear from a lot and get their story and, and why they're, why they are passionate about what they do laying stone or being an electrician or plumbing or whatever it is you know I've, I've got a podcast for you to listen to which i'll send you as well but it's Dwayne pierce's level up podcast from australia yeah. he's he's a builder and yeah you you will enjoy his stuff he has a lot of those guys on um on his podcast mm, yeah. and it is fascinating you know to hear their not they're just their take on business and, and things like that, but their take on their craft. Another guy that I had on my podcast here a little while ago was a guy called Ken Rusk, who wrote a book called Blue Collar Cash. And he's a contractor from <clears throat> up uh, north in America. And uh, he talks about the fact that, you know, it takes human endeavor and, and people's hands and intuition and mind and um, ability and passion for what they're doing to to put stuff together and mm -hmm. you know for I don't know how long probably 30 plus years maybe longer 50 years maybe uh, a higher education has been the thing that has been if you didn't have one you were dumb or you 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 wouldn't succeed or you would only succeed if you had as higher education and Ken's like his whole thing is, is, you know, that isn't that, that, that a that's no longer true, and b yeah, not yeah. only is it not true, it is no longer the path to it as well. Don't you don't need to leave school with a massive debt uh, for your uh, from you know your your higher education, and mm -hmm. go into something that isn't going to serve you well a financially but b passionately. And like you say, you get to work with some of the best craftsmen in the country and certainly in Texas. And you see that the way they operate and the way they think about what they're doing, they're artisans. They're, they're highly creative yes. people that might be yeah, putting things together. They're not dummies or, you know, like the, this isn't. And yeah, I think. Apple, no, I mean, that, that, I absolutely gonna, right. I mean, just just because somebody doesn't have that piece of paper saying that they went to some, some four year school. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're not intelligent. And, and yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I think I cut it, you. Uh, no, no passionate about it, wanting to learn more about it. I was yeah. going to say, um, I think Apple in their latest intake figures or something, it's something like maybe 50% of when not graduates. Mm -hmm. So there is a tech company that now is going, you yeah. know, well, our workforce doesn't need to have a degree. And they also take their people and not necessarily just Apple, but a lot of these big companies now, and they, they go, well, if the person's got the right mindset, intuition, level of, of ability, uh, intelligence, capability, capacity, <clears throat> we can train them in mm -hmm. these highly specialized spaces that we need. And these people can excel in, the, in what they're really passionate about. Um, yeah, whereas absolutely. once upon a time, everybody down the same road and you come out with a bachelor's degree or something. And it's like, it doesn't mean you're ready for work. It just means that you, uh, yeah, like you, you've got a degree. I've got a girl who works for me and she's amazing. She's just done her bachelor's in area commercial design. And in her course, she is the only one who has had an interior design job from before she started to still working with yeah. me. 
and she's the only one no, that's I, got it. And I think that that's that's super smart, and that's that's I think a better structure. You know, I, I'm I'm going to tell my kids. You know, they're still young, but I would much rather you know this money that we're putting away for their college. You know, I'm not against college. I'm not against mm-hmm. getting a four year degree, obviously, but I think it'd be much smarter to you know when you graduate high school you know, go off and go off and start a business. You know, let's take this money that we've saved up. I'll help you, I'll help you start a business. You know what it is. I think you should go into a industry that you're right. You follow the passion, go into yeah. the industry that you're passionate about. Don't go to school, not really knowing what, what you want to do and try to find your way and find a degree, you know, and just kind of throw darts at the dartboard. It's like, let's go get the experience first. Yeah. You know, yeah. Let's let's let's, let's start live a little. Living. Yeah, live a little. Yeah, find let's out. Let's live a little. A little. Let's yeah. get some business experience, and you know, if it fails, oh well. If you know, we'll try something else. Yeah. If, if it's if it's something that you end up liking, and and you want to pursue it, and and from there, if you want to go on and get a higher education, then you know, By to improve, means. you know, yeah. then then go for it. Yeah. I mean, I mm. think that's how it should be structured, where you know, instead of just getting out of high school and going immediately to college. You know, because because at the end of your stint there at the university, you still have no experience. That's you a, have the piece of paper, but you don't have the experience. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's like let's kind of flip flop it. Let's let's get some experience first, and then go pursue that higher education. So you know, with all your podcast guests, um, as a percentage, how many of them would have a degree? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think all of them. I mean, we've. I think all of them. Yeah. So, uh, so, the, so you. That's a good question. Yeah, it's an, I, I was running through my mind when you were talking, going, <clears throat> okay, so what is their educational I mean, background, and then what yeah. do they actually end up doing, and how do they? I think often with trades, it may not be as easily articulated what they do because it's such a hands-on process. You know, it, it would mm-hmm. make a better video clip than it would necessarily a conversation. You know, yeah. the way they describe how they do something may not translate as well as it when they show you how they do something. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, all designers should do is, and, and maybe not the ones who are just building things for the computer or for, for a virtual world, but all designers should spend time whether it's from like i used to be a clothing designer whether it's clothing or whether it's you know watchmaking or jewelry or pottery Mm. or whatever um if you're going to design it you should spend some time doing it and actually like for me i go i love getting to site and seeing construction and understanding why that's the the way that they're going to put it together or they want to put it together or, you know, like actually seeing it going together because it makes a big difference to me seeing that go together rather than it just being in the drawing. I go, oh, yeah, okay, that could, we could have simplified that or that could be simpler if we did it this way and it might be better, mm-hmm. it might be cleaner, less complicated. Yeah, all those things, all those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we go through, you know, construction details all time and you sit there and wonder like what was this person thinking when they drew this you know this is so overly complicated and complex it's like man let's clean this up a little bit you know this this isn't actually how this goes together and and clearly again it's just somebody who's uh, who's drawing something who you know they're this they're there to pump out details and Mm -hmm. or, or renderings and they don't necessarily have that knowledge of, of how something is built or how it goes together, and, you know. Yeah, how it fits in the bigger piece so, of the jigsaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah without exactly. A doubt. Without a doubt. Tell me, with your podcast, I've always got these little highlight learnings that I've had on my podcasts, and there's, you know, undoubtedly one from every podcast I've recorded. There's some big light bulb moments. Got any any crazy you know strikes of lightning that you went oh damn yeah that changed my thinking hmm yeah that's that's a good question you know we're we're 17 episodes in I, you've definitely been you've been doing this a little longer than i have 
you know, it's, I, I started off just getting people who I knew, mm-hmm. you know, or connections that I've had, people who, yeah. who I knew. I don't, I don't know if I've necessarily had that light bulb moment yet. Um, just because all, you know, all of the people again, that we get on, you know, we, we have prior relationships with, and, you know, I kind of know where they stand on a lot of things. And so it's mainly just sitting down with them and, and having a, a conversation about, you know, design or construction. Mm-hmm. I, I will say the, I'll say this, I think the most fun episode we did was with this uh, artist he he's based out of out of Austin. Keith, oh man, I can't remember his last name, but he he, um, he like I said he's a he's an artist and he does like graphic design and um so again you know not something that I'm familiar with mm-hmm. that's totally outside of you know my purview and but what what I really liked about him was just his energy, you know the yeah. energy that he brought to the conversation and how you know you you might not know a lot about a certain subject you know or you might know what this other person's talking about but you get so fired up about it because they're fired up about it you know and (laughs) yeah and it's like sometimes you know every every now and then i'll listen to joe rogan's podcast and you know they get to talking about mma and all this other stuff and i have no interest in mma is not something that i I don't watch it but listening to him talk about it really gets me fired up i'm like man this sounds awesome you know because it's something again that you know he has a passion in um and so listening to uh to keith talk the whole time i was like just the energy in the room and uh he, he's a great guy uh keith young sorry i think that, keith that's his name yeah i I'm, um, I'm like you i think that what happens is is that you get infected by people's passion and their love of what they do and you kind of get dragged down the road with them. Yeah. And when I mm-hmm. say drag, not drag, you're, you're running down the road with them. You're trying to keep up with where they're going. And yeah. there's an excitement in that. I, I remember one of my biggest first first early big light moments. And again, I mine started out with all people I knew. Uh, well, not mm-hmm. quite, but you know, there's a couple of people I didn't know in the first few um, because they were people that other people knew that I said I was starting this yep. and but I I there's a architect out of Alabama called Jeffrey Dungan and uh I reference this lots. He was saying we were chatting and he does these amazing pretty traditional styled homes and we were chatting and he said to me something I said to him, sorry you must have some great projects i think it was and he's like yeah kind of like bit offhand and I'm like oh, all right and he said you know it's not about great projects it's about great people and with great mm-hmm. people come great projects and uh, yeah. i'm like that was like it being slapped on the side of the head you know for years i've always gone <laughs> where's a great project you know that's another great project oh wow and well, oh, that project was really fun, but those people, man, they were really hard work or they weren't very enjoyable to work with or whatever. And I remember running upstairs and saying to my wife, who's a, a business coach and an executive recruiter, just as her own recruitment company, and just running upstairs and going, I'm banging myself on the forehead, you know, in front of her and going, <laughs> I cannot believe it. I've been in this industry for how many years? And this guy says it's not about the project, it's about the people. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe I hadn't seen it before. And just that little piece yeah. of a shift was, yep. I I no longer am ever searching for great projects. I'm always just searching for great people to work with. And that is the joy. Yeah. And, and, and it's with the podcast as well. It's searching for... Yeah, who light your fire up and that you go. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. it, this this piece, you know, you learn something, you take it somewhere. So, yeah, the podcast, as you as you said, you know, you kind of jumped in, and nobody really realizes just how much work it really takes. It yes, it, it does. It's a commitment, and getting yeah. you you yeah, often have multiples of people on yours as well. Like so that 
just organizing everybody in a time frame alone is is an an issue and then getting it getting it edited getting it out loading yep. it up on the yeah. sites and yeah it, yeah a lot of a lot of late nights you know doing doing the editing and i, I mean i try to keep it as minimal as, as possible but but yeah there's there's a lot of a lot of late nights staying up and you know got to get the kids to bed first and then, then i'll stay up and edit it but yeah it, it, it was a commitment and and I, and I think that's in the long run I, I guess my hope is like i was saying with you know talking with keith young and and just hearing the, the passion that he has and i think that's that's kind of what i'd like to portray you know with with podcast is it's it's a very niche podcast i mean admittedly you're, you're, you know we're not getting huge numbers because it's it's just construction and design related you know there, i don't think there's a lot of people out there you, you know tuning in to listen to construction podcast but I, I think if the passion is there and, and people can you know maybe maybe hear that and and see that passion that they might be kind of drawn into the conversation and, and drawn into the industry you know because you know there is a, a labor shortage no doubt and you know we're running into problems where you know a lot of you know these older generations are are moving out of the industry and you know there's just not enough of these younger guys coming up to, to fill their shoes yeah so you know i think part of the goal with this podcast is to to try to inspire you know young guys coming into the industry that you know it this is this is fun i mean it, it is a fun industry like i was saying earlier you know it's just a big puzzle you're, you're just yeah. problem solving all day you, you got to wear multiple hats you keep your head on a swivel you know yeah. people come at you with all different kinds of questions all day you know plumber here the carpenter over there the electrician needs you here and you know you're running around and you got to have those answers ready and and it's it's super fun and so i wouldn't you know i try to encourage anybody you know if they're looking to get into the industry that you know it's it demands a lot from you you know it really does but it's rewarding it's well the demand of it is actually the fulfillment of it it's like you get to problem solving you know, humans naturally are reasonably good problem solvers and they're very adaptable. And so that if you've got a high problem solving um, skills and, you know, you're analytical and mm-hmm. then if you, uh, I mean, I often think like how hard could it be to put up a wall? Uh, go and put one up and see how well you do. You know, without sure. without watching a tradesman do it or somebody who's actually done a million times. Um, exactly. Yeah. You know, just the the simple tricks and methods that they use that are just time taught methods that just make it easier, just mean it straighter. Just like what happens when it's got a bow in it? How do you deal with that? What What do you do? You know, just all these things. And I think that yep. the you know you you delve into even more things in the industry like building biology um, as opposed to just building science and you've got all these fields of things that change and come and grow and are challenging the thinking of what we can have in the future and i go yeah this is the joy or part of the joy of the industry you know like it's a massive joy in the industry is is that it's progressing constantly and mm-hmm. you know like I think that without human, the thing that amazes me most in life is, is you look at the pyramids would be a great example, the state capitol building in Austin, you know, any of any any big structure, any structure that you know, going back to the pyramids, we don't even know how they were built. Um, or aliens, history. I've heard. Yeah, yeah, aliens, yeah. And then you go, <laughs> you know, you go through all these different stages of it, but it was all human endeavor. It was all yep. an idea. And it was people with their hands physically yeah. doing something that created something. And I remember when I first ever was a clothes designer and seeing somebody wearing a piece of clothing that I designed in mass production that, you know, I designed it, we'd made samples and all the rest and knew how it went together. And then it went out, got sold to the public. And then in this case, it was on a beach and I'm like, I, I felt such connection with the person I'd never met before, A, because they'd chosen something I'd drawn, 
but B, because I'd actually <laughs> sent it on somebody other than the model that was wearing it when we photographed it kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah. Just that whole thing. And, and one of the things I love about designing, I design houses, but designing houses is being able to drive past them and, mm -hmm. and see them. Yeah. And yeah. I know with, you know, some of the trades guys that we work with, they'll say to me, ah, oh, remember that job and that wall was just, that was just a pig. Everything went wrong with it. It was just like <laughs> a nightmare, but we overcame it in the end. And man, look at it like, you know, 10 years on, um, you know, it, it was so worth doing it right. You know, all these things uh, where they had to use all their intuition and all their knowledge and really push to make it happen. And they get an amazing result at the end of it. And so does the client and so does the designer. Everybody gets this amazing result. But it's not yeah. without a huge amount of human endeavor along the way. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I and I know exactly what you're talking about, driving by, like, projects that you've completed. And um, that that's rewarding. You know, you drive by and you're like, hey, kids. I know. Daddy built that house. Yeah. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. And, and it's, and it's going to be there. You know, hopefully, yep. and, you know, until I die or after, but it's, it is, it's, it's super cool to, to drive by. And then, you know, I actually plot on a map, you know, all the different yeah. jobs that I've, that I've done over the years. And uh, it's interesting to see like how it adds up. You're like, wow, I've done more quite than a I few. I was. Bad, quite yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. <laughs> but, um, you, but you're right about, about human endeavor. I mean, it, it takes, you know, great people to, to achieve great things. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Empire State Building is another example of, of that. And it took them 12, 12 months to, to build that. And that was before internet, before phones, before, yep. you know, all of that stuff, before yep. OSHA. Yep. <laughs> you could, just, you, you know, you lived in the surrounding area and you, that's all you did. You, you yep. built. Yep. You know, there, there was no distractions, nothing. What was that's the how build, they were able to achieve What was that. the build time frame? Was it 12 years? For the Empire State Building? Yeah. I but no, I believe it was like twelve to fourteen months. Really? It's it's I I believe so. I mean, shoot, wow. I have to Google it afterwards. Oh, yeah. So I hope I'm yeah. not telling you wrong. But I I think yeah, the Empire State Building was was twelve to fourteen months. But I mean, it, it took an entire you know an entire city. Like I said, they they yeah. all lived in the surrounding area, all the workers, and that's they traveled from other states to come there and and to work and because and, they it. knew this and and build the building. Yeah, I mean, it's that's. That's what they're there to do, and, and this was before internet, before phones. There's no distractions. You're you're just you're just wow. working. And I've got to look that up. I got to look. I, it I up. hope I'm not. I'm oh, not well, it, wrong. Whatever it is, it's surprisingly fast. Yeah. 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 So. Oh, awesome. So, the last question, or a couple of last questions for you. One is, yeah. in your own home, where's your favorite space? And what emotion does that favorite space evoke for you? You know, be, being a, a father, I, you know, I got two little ones. I, I think I think my favorite space is, is probably just the backyard. We we love spending time outside, and I I built a, a big playscape for them. You know, out of, out of nothing, just some spare you know pieces of timber I had laying around, and uh -huh. I, I built them a, a swing set with some steel columns and a, and a beam across the top. And I, I fenced in the whole backyard so we could let them run free and let the dogs out. And that's, yeah. that's probably our favorite, favorite spot. And, and it just, yeah, it just brings a sense of calm. You know, we live uh, outside of Austin uh, about an hour. And uh -huh. so it's, it's not as busy as it is in, in the city. It's quiet. You know, we have really lovely neighbors. And so, it's it's nice to just go out on the back patio, sit and, and you know, play with the kids, relax and and play with the dogs. And it just brings a sense of calm. You know, you, you come home from a hectic, busy day and you've been away from your family all day and all, all you wanna do is just go home and see them and you know hang out. Give them a big hang out and give them a big hug and, and hear about their day and so I, I mean that. that's I love that's that. What I'm, that. That's what keeps me going. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know about you, but just the the family and you know coming home and seeing them and and knowing that they're safe and happy and they have what they need and 
you know, that's that does it for me. That's all very, I mean. Very fulfilling feeling, eh? Like a very, very yeah. fulfilling feeling. And and obviously like with it being the backyard and that you've made it into a playscape as well. <laughs> being able to get out there and play as well and engage, <laughs> interact. And it's outdoors as opposed to being, say, indoors. <clears throat> Oh yeah. It's when, when you know, like when I ask that question, I, I get so many amazing answers with it as to I bet, yeah. Yeah. As to what where it is and what it is that makes people feel different different emotions, like what emotions does it bring up? And then my other question is going to be I use this question a lot. One last project. After that you're done. You there's no more project. What do you choose? And why? Hmm. It has to be in the in like I'm assuming a residential project. Oh, no, anything you could be building a chopper. Building a chopper. Ah, okay, <laughs> no, there you go. What is it that you would be the thing that you go? You know, if I'm allowed to do any other kind of project, this is it. I'm. All, it's all done. What would I choose to do? You know, I I think what I would do if I could would probably be to restore an old muscle car with with my dad and and with my kids because oh, oh. that that was something that that we got to do when I was younger my my brother it was me my brother and my dad and you know we had a, a 66 Mustang a, a coupe yeah. and you know we spent many summers i think it took about 3 years uh, off and on you know re- restoring that thing and it's a good memory you know, and it, it gives you an appreciation for, you know, the automobiles and where they've been and uh, what they are now. And it teaches you things, you know, ha- how to work on them. And then you just get the, the, the bonding together, uh-huh. um, you know, being to, working together. And if I could, that would probably be my last project would, would be to restore a, an old muscle car with my dad and my two kids. I think that'd be pretty amazing. It'd be like if you didn't I think get, so too. Yeah. If you didn't get to do anything else, that would certainly leave a legacy and you just listen to the the fact that you did it yourself and you'd be repeating that legacy and creating the same kind of bonding and feelings. But it'd be interesting yeah. to know with your brother and your dad <laughs> with it, how they felt about the one they did. For that same reason, hey, like just yeah, yeah, because they probably got very similar shared experiences from it, and yeah, it, yeah, you could also be creating something or recreating something. I love that it's restoratory as well. Yeah, you know, there's mm-hmm. the the company Patagonia, you know, the clothing company Patagonia. I remember mm-hmm. reading once yeah. that they often they often open their shops in buildings that they restore. So they buy a building and they restore the building. And because they're a destination brand, they don't have to be in the main street. Sometimes they are, but they Mm. don't have to be in the main street. People will go to them. They'll go and find them. And one of the things that they love to do is is take an old building. I suppose it's a bit like gentrification of an area. Mm -hmm. And then they will buy the building, do it up, make it into something special. And obviously it's a Patagonia store, uh, but they regenerate neighborhood by doing that as well. So they create more community because somebody else goes, oh, Patagonia is there. So we'll go here. And it just brings community around. Yeah. And I think that when you have things like that, you know, like the old cars and things that only can be restored, they're not, they they're not going to be remade. They're going to be they're restored, mm-hmm. you know. And yep. there's a simple like in the '66 Mustang. There's a simplicity to the mechanics of it. It's oh, not computer simple. driven. Yeah. No, yeah. it's so much easier to work on. Your lawnmower <laughs> these days is probably more complicated <laughs> oh, than a, a '66. You know. Yeah. Yep. Probably I th- so. I think that's awesome, man. Hey. Lani, so good to chat, man. And yeah. I'm going to hook you up with a couple of people to maybe chat on your podcast with. Um, oh, that would that'd well. be great. That's super helpful. Yeah, yeah I, I had a blast. You. Yeah, cool, man. I had a blast, Adrian. I appreciate your, your time. And uh, thank you again for, you know, giving me the, the time to, to come uh-huh. on here and talk. And hopefully next time you're in Austin, I know every now and then you like to 
come yeah. you know come to the americas and and come to austin and i'd love to sit down and have a drink with you and, and talk yeah i'll be there in february late three as my plan at this point so let's see if we Perfect. can't make it happen it'd be really cool be really let's cool. do it that sounds like fun and for all our listeners in the house podcast go and have a listen it's about construction and design and beyond that it's about like creativity and passion and I think Lenny's an amazing job with what he's done with it and it's worth the listen may not be for you but it may be for somebody you know and if it is for you give him a shout out send him a review you know he's he's pushing it out there how many episodes did you say 17 yeah Something we're, we're like that. 17 yeah. so yeah yeah we're still cranking them out yeah no that's <clears> cool man you take care i'll let you get back to work and thank you so much for yeah. your time i really appreciate it buddy and happy new year thanks adrian yeah happy new year to t- you to you too thank you cheers man thanks hi guys i'm adrian i'm your host of talk design podcast I started this podcast a couple of years ago, and in doing it, my aim was to talk to amazing design people, creative minds, people who I could learn from, and hopefully you could learn from. This was a big part of my whole reasoning for starting the podcast. We've cracked over 80 episodes, and we've done two homes tour specials for the AIA Austin in Texas which have been really great fun, talking just specifically about houses. We've talked to HGTV stars. We've talked to building designers, interior designers, architects, business coaches, and some inspired characters along the way. People who have captured my imagination and their creative output and gone, huh, these people would bring a story to somebody else and maybe inspire them to go a little further with what they're doing as well. So I wanted to reach out and ask you all for some advice because you are the guys who tune in and listen and subscribe, and I really appreciate that. So I want some advice from you. If you guys would be happy to share with me, A, what you like best, so that I can better direct what we cover as content, And then also, if there's things you want to solve, what are the three biggest things you would like information on? What are those kind of keys so that I can look and go, okay, let's find somebody who speaks specifically on these points and get some depth of information back to you that would be really useful in your business or in your life or in your home, whichever one it would be. So if I could ask you to do that, I would be forever grateful if you would share with me just through the email based on the Talk Design website, which is www.talkdesign.show. If you could just reach out by that email and say to me, hey, this would be a really great subject for me, for my business or for my family or for my home or for the way I want to see life. I would love to be able to support you guys and find those people that we could talk to that would bring that to you. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I so appreciate the fact that you listen to the podcast. It makes it all the more fun when I get messages from you to say, hey, this inspired me. I had somebody who sent me one the other day that said, your podcast, and we were talking on a certain subject, it was a game changer for me. It was a game changer in how I viewed how I was looking at what I was doing with my design and what was going to come from that. So these things make it all the more worthwhile. So please, if you could tell me top three things that would be useful to you, I would love to support you guys in delivering that. Thank you. And thank you for being a listener. Take care. Have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are, whatever it is. Cheers, Adrian. Over and out.